inside America's boardrooms. The informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources and also the co-founder and editor-at-large of Corporate Board Member Magazine. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today, we sort of have a part two. Last week, we sort of set the foundation for the Investors Stewardship Group. And we're going to talk about that further today. Um, in fact, we have a member of that group that we hope to find out some information. Please welcome Tracy Stewart, who's the Senior Corporate Govern An Governance Analyst for the Florida State Board of Administration. Welcome, Tracy. So, um, gave a little introduction. Um, uh, we had on Darla Stuckey last week, and we sort of set the foundation of, of this. But now here we have a member. Um, the Florida State Board of Administration is a founding member of the uh, Investor Stewardship Group. Uh, can you sort of share why you felt this was important to do and, and sort of the reasons why you're part of uh, yeah. the stewardship group? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, I think it came out of an effort among a lot of different types of investors. You know, I think this, is, this group itself is just quite a coup. You've got pen public pension funds, you've got some activist investors, and then you've got the big three, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. Um, who together usually control like 15, 18 percent of, of the vote. So the group members pretty much looked over our internal voting policies and, and our, our proxy voting histories and we looked for a floor of what everybody agreed on unanimously. Um, and so it was quite an undertaking to really dig deep into what are across this large group, these, these really varied types of investors, what are the commonalities and to use that then as a united front to talk to companies. And it helps for us to be able to have a united front and not have different messaging when we're talking to companies. But it helps companies too. I think a lot of the, the better leading edge companies are already implementing almost everything that's in the, the ISG principles. Um, and they deserve credit for being leaders in that. But it, it's really something that by establishing a floor of, mi of minimum acceptable you know, conduct and, and policies, you can help bring up the bottom of companies that aren't meeting those thresholds. And one of the really most important pieces to me that's in the ISG framework was the ability for everybody to agree that there should be one share, one vote. We see a lot of cases where there's a mismatch between um, economic exposure and your voting power. And that that's problematic. I mean, there's just a case out this, this week of a company where there's a, C a founder CEO that's been fired from the board, but he still controls the vast majority of the voting power. So he just removed directors. They fired him, and then he removed those directors and put some in that were that were uh, better for him. So by establishing a floor, you really get to the point where y you, as a, l a large amount of the market, uh, us investors, are saying to companies, we expect at least this minimum of, for standards of behavior. And the irony is some investors haven't wanted to sign on to it yet. I think there's a few, you know, pretty significant um, investors that are looking at it and they're, you know, they're sort of thinking to themselves, like, the, the, the negative things we've heard back from people about why they haven't joined is they're afraid that it, the standards don't go far enough. But, you know, we're, we're really trying to get this collective match. And so it's okay for us. Our, you know, our, sta our individual standards, the way that Florida votes and does our proxies, we go beyond what's the minimum, you know, that we're saying with, with the ISG. We go, we're, we have a lot tougher policies than what the ISG says. But I think that there's still value in coming together and saying, these are the things we firmly agree on. We can still go above and beyond that. And so I'm hoping that other public pension funds and other investor types will see that as not something that would erode their ability to engage with companies and instead really just serve to be like a homogenizing force on the agreed upon minimum basic standards. So um, first of all, this group represents some $20 trillion. So yeah. that's, that yeah. speaks volumes. Yeah. Um, also, um, there's some question about 
so when we hit January 18th, so what, what, what are the expectations? Is this going to be a disclosure type of thing where you want companies to buy on? That isn't clear yet sort of what happens. Is, can you give any insight to that? Yeah, sort of. I mean, I think that companies are going to take it and run with it in, in their own individual way. You know, this is our message to them of what, what we expect them to do. Um, and I, by the way, you guys have principles for you, you as well, which is right. unique. Not only are there... Yeah, and I think that's important because a lot of times when we're, when we're talking to companies, you know, they want, they, they have sometimes a perception that we are just, because we uh, subscribe to ISS and Glass-Lewis, that we might just be blindly following their advice. Um, and so, you know, we are also an intermediary. We, we're asking companies to do the right thing because they're managing our money, basically. They're, you know, we've got a separation of ownership and, 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 and management. Um, we've invested in them and we want them to do the right thing. But we as pension funds or, you know, large institutional right. investors, we are also taking money from someone and then deploying it on their behalf. So there really has to be like a self-reflection there. And, you know, you ask yourself, like, if I'm going to ask companies to do the right thing and to, to be transparent and to be responsive to, you know, what, what our input is, we then should do that to our beneficiaries as well. You know, it's just... It's just good governance. Yeah. You know? So I interrupted you. Is there anything else that companies should be doing as of the 18th? I mean, I think that if they're not meeting the minimum standards and a, the dual class share is, is really one of the most pivotal pieces, I think. I think that's really important. There's few companies that have that, but when they do, it's such an insulating, um, in, you know, like an entrenchment device. It really hampers investors' ability to make changes um, to either our you know, to exercising our voting rights or, um, you know, to putting the directors that we see fit. Um, investors don't often throw directors out, but we, when you need to, you need to be able to do that. So it's, it's really something that we hope that companies will look inside and say, okay, these are my, this is a significant amount of my voting um, and ownership. We're hoping that they will look at themselves and, and at least take the minimum standards and, and going beyond that would be great, but you know, transparency, having disclosure, having comp that's modeled on performance factors and not just time vesting. I mean, these some of this is no-brainer stuff, and the the good companies out there are already doing this, and they're doing it well, and they're serving as leaders and examples. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are not not quite you know right. up to snuff, and we need those companies. I think that this will snowball somewhat into um, pressure for them. And so far, you know, they've resisted it, but I, I'm really heartened by the idea that we've gotten this much agreement across this many investors. It's, it's really, I mean, it's very, I think it's very powerful. Yeah. It, it's similar to the common sense principles. I think the, the fact that you've got both sides working towards this commonality and just setting this professional level of this is the behavior that we expect from you. These are the rights that we as investors expect from you, and we expect you to allow us to exercise them properly. I think coming from both sides, that's that's a powerful message. Yeah. So we've got about three minutes left, but there's something that I really wanted to talk to you about because you and I have had this discussion. This, yeah. what's your comments? Just where we're a good segue to this. You and I have talked about there's still a number of directors that aren't contributing or you know, yeah. question whether they should be on the board or not. Um, PwC came out with its study, um, yeah. its annual um, corporate director survey. Mm -hmm. And the number of directors that said that there should be someone on the, at least one person on the board that should be replaced has climbed from the 33 range percent to 46 yeah. percent. Now, I'm curious on your reactions when you hear a number like that. Yeah. Uh, part of it, I sort of feel like all of us should take credit for because we've created a much more sensitive environment where people are looking at who's Absolutely. contributing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in the long term, you want this number to be going down. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. what, what's your reaction when you see that? And what would you say to companies that, you know, they should be doing, yeah. you know, in this case? Well, it's terrifying, quite frankly. I mean, I, when we see something like that, it just, it, it confirms our deepest fears in that, that there's this dysfunction in the boardroom that's difficult for us to see from the outside. We get such a united front. I. I've never seen a board issue a withhold rec or a vote against rec from one of their, old, their own members, right? They're just re-nominated. I'd love to see companies, board members, maybe do a private ballot and say, 
you know, what do you think about this person being renominated? And for once in a while, coming to investors and saying, yeah, they're on the board, they're up for nomination, but we don't, we don't, we don't support them. There's got to be some kind of mechanism. They just need to do the tough work. You, well, you, they've got to find a way to give that message, and they can't rely on things like retirement age limitations. I mean, I think that's ageism. Yeah. Um, it, it's a lazy way of of weeding things out. I, I but, I'm looking for smarter ways for them to do that. But the answer to that, which we've covered many times in this show, is yeah. board evaluations. Okay, and particularly Absolutely. particularly peer to peer. Yeah. Because you're you're evaluating yeah. now. The fear is we don't know how many people act. Yeah. Because you know, that's the tough part. Yeah. I think a lot of people do great board evaluations. Yeah. I'm not sure that I can say that a lot of people act on those the way they should be or counseling yeah. or not renominating or whatever. Yeah. And that's the scary part yeah. about the number. I think the sensitivity to it is smart because I think what boards are, and directors individually are recognizing is that they're, they'll all go down together. If you've got an underperforming board member, that threatens your reputation. And that's exactly what we need. You know, that's exactly what we as investors need from directors. We need them to be concerned for themselves because self, you know, your, your self-preservation mechanism, if, that, if they don't want to go down with, with the ship, you know, hopefully they will sound alarms. They will take steps to get those directors out. The worst thing that can happen is when you have a collegial environment where everyone's kind of afraid to point out right. the obvious. So I just, there's got to be a change in the nomination process. I mean, I'm heartened by proxy access and some of that stuff, but we, from the outside as investors, we don't, we can't see these kind of things. We can't see if somebody's going off on rants and tangents and not reading their materials and asking, you know, ridiculous questions or wasting people's time. The other directors, they have to act out of self-preservation, which is indirectly, you know, going to help us and work on our behalf to weed, to weed these out. I think, I think the more, once it gets kind of on a roll and it's something that, that starts getting out there as, you know, here's how we dealt with it, I think it'll, it'll prompt some braveness amongst these directors. But it's, it's concerning. It's concerning that there's, there's a fear in acting on those board evaluations. Yeah. Well, Tracy Stewart, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Uh, we're going to have to watch yeah. you know, what happens um, in all this, and, uh, but we appreciate that you coming on and sort of filling us in on some of the gaps on the uh, investors' stewardship group. Absolutely. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardroom. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take a, take a look at another critical topic that will help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance.